Hello everybody and uh, welcome to the course here. Uh, this is INST 570 Information Security Ethics and Legal Aspects at the University of North America. I'm Adjunct Professor Andy Molnar. Happy to be spending this time with you over the next uh, 10 weeks or so. Uh, always, if you have any questions or concerns in this course, if you fall behind, uh, if, if issues of life come up, uh, reach out to me as soon as possible. It's nothing we can't work through together, I'm sure. I do respond very quickly. So let's work together to accomplish your goals uh, at the uh, UONA, please. Now I will offer, I think this is a fun class, uh, if you're up to it. By the end of our time together, you'll be part lawyer, part philosopher, part sociologist, uh, you'll even have an idea of how uh, we in our republic work to balance freedom of everything, it seems, uh, with the good of society in general, right, uh, as we look through the lens of uh, IT. Okay. So as a quick note, I usually record in uh, 13 to 15 minute segments. I think that makes uh, for it easier for you to absorb the material, uh, maybe to keep up with your work-life balance, to do portions of the reading, right? Right before you read, uh, view that, that lecture or right after. So be sure to view all the videos. And again, the lectures are not a replacement for the reading or the literature presented. Uh, so now, I suppose, let's uh, begin. So the book starts out, uh, I like it, with a poem. I love a poem. Uh, and the point of which is that we drive, do we drive technology or does technology really drive us? That's the quintessential question of this book, that we're going to look at some uh, philosophies and then how they apply to laws and ethics about about technology is it driving us or are we driving uh, technology right for the good of society so this is a question we'll ask and address over and over again through various perspectives various philosophies uh, and we'll look at ethics and the law in the process here is our um, chapter how it's organized in the book and we'll be following that in these slides now uh, most of us Whoops, let me put that back, make sure that's good to go. Most of us uh, may take technology for granted, right? That's how the book starts out, and I would agree with that. Uh, I find it to be completely true. In fact, I find that older people tend to be more concerned with privacy, right? If I'm looking for a balance or a scale divider. And the younger generation, they want privacy, I, I think, uh, if I did a survey or a poll. Uh, but they're more willing to give up their privacy uh, without much question, as long as they have access to what they desire, right? They've grown up in the internet. And I think that changes your perspective. And you may look at the various philosophies we approach through that lens if you choose to, right? It'd be very interesting. Now, um, with these items on this page, right, we all agree we're living in this information age. Uh, which continues to expand rapidly. Uh, back in uh, 1990, few people did any sort of emails, right? And today there are hundreds of billions of emails exchanged. In fact, globally, as of 2019, there were almost 300 billion emails sent every single day. And you know it's over that today. And there are currently um, now over 4 billion users worldwide of email. So findings reveal this continued growth of the email sent each and every day. Uh, and, and it continues to grow exponentially, right? Um, so recall even that the World Wide Web that we take for granted almost today, I think, um, it was first, it was still being designed in the 1990s, right? Even though we're going to go through the long history of how we got there, it's important to understand the history so we can apply the right philosophies um, and, and, and then law, right? Today, it contains more than a trillion pages. So think of that. In um, 30 years, we went from almost no pages on the World Wide Web, which is just a document repository, basically, to over a trillion pages. Can you imagine... Um, 
all the COVID ca- uh, all that the COVID caused for homeschoolers. Can you imagine them without the World Wide Web in this crisis that we're in uh, at this time period? Um, and at almost all ages, the students are using the World Wide Web, right? Even even two th- and not two three, even five six year olds using the World Wide Web to look stuff up. It's it's incredible. So this information that we are in kind of drives our modern era, right? These new technologies and this unprecedented access that we just discussed. And so the catalyst for this, right? The the internet's been around for a while. Computers have been around for a while. But the catalyst now are low-cost computers, high-speed communication networks that are really changing everything that we're trying to do. Now, uh, imagine the high-speed broadband computer used also for wireless communications and the World Wide Web the, to access the data repos- the document repository, right? It's not even your home computer, your laptop, your tablet. Now it's your phone, right? Uh, getting smaller, faster, leaner all the time. So some of the transformations we saw on the last page are physical and some are not, right? Uh, there's a a thing in our brain called the hippocampus, right? And the hippocampus is a region of the brain responsible for long-term memory. It requires mental exercises, right? The neurons inside our brains, they release dopamine, which we're going to talk about uh, again several times, even in chapter three, when we talk about sexting and uh, internet pornography and other things that we want to weigh the good of society uh, versus the law, right, through the philosophies that we're going to study. So the hippocampus, right, is responsible again for that uh, long-term memory and release of dopamine, producing a desire to seek out additional information. And round and round we go. Um, And and, and so, gosh, maybe that's where we get the expression, I feel like a dope, right? Because it seems like you go round and round pursuing some of the same uh, aspects. So adopting these technologies I would offer can change our perceptions, right? So phones, for example, make us feel safer as we're looking to apply philosophies. Uh, Yet at the same time, when we lose one, imagine how vulnerable we really feel. Now, uh, this in this picture is one reason the Amish are slow to adopt technology. In fact, they're uh, Amish bishops, as the reading uh, describes. They meet a couple of times a year and they incor- to, to discuss things in the church, including an aspect of it to discuss implementing or incorporating technology. So the key question they ask is, does it bring us together or does it draw us apart? It's a great philosophical approach. Um, the text gives some examples. I think it mentioned the gas grill that the Amish have incorporated into the life because it was determined that that was a technology that brings people together. So they understand that new technologies, much to the point of this whole course, solves problems. But they uh, are wary because they can often create problems too. So on our part, uh, we own what we own. Uh, So we have to control, what we do is we have to control whether we uh, adapt, adopt it or not into our lives. So then we'll look now at some milestones in computing um, because adopting these technologies often have has a social impact, okay? So uh, there are uh, various forms and efforts of increasing speed and accuracy that have existed for ages, right? We've been chasing this for eons. Uh, these are just some examples uh, pulled from the Quinn text. Uh, Notice that even in the ancient times, the clay and tablets were erasable. I thought that was great. Um, As well as slates later, of course, right? Uh, So we learned as human beings that we have limitations early on, uh, is what I pulled from that. So uh, the text, uh, this picture here, uh, shows that 500-year-old picture of people counting and trying to do it faster, leaner, more streamlined, right? Uh, 
even uh, someone like Blaise, Blaise Pascal, uh, Blaise as I like to call him, of course, uh, developed a calculator type around 1640. Um, and then later, uh, he was followed up by a German named Leibniz, uh, who made it even better. And his uh, counting device uh, could, uh, calculator could add, subtract, divide, and multiply whole numbers, right? It was called the Step Reckoner, which I think is a great name, a great name, Step Reckoner. Uh, and, and technology continued to uh, take us to great places. Developments continued, and even now we reach America in our conversation. The golden age, the uh, golden age, yeah, the gilded age, as it's called, which was centered around a rapid industrialization and economic expansion and a concentration of power. We might talk things in a history course like imminent uh, domain and um, manifest destiny and things like that, right? So this is a social change that is driving uh, our productivity uh, increases. So it's not surprising that the adoption of mechanical calculators led to this de-skilling uh, of uh, workers in a bookshop, right, which were everywhere. Uh, and they, the book even refers to it as a feminization of bookkeeping. I'm not sure I would go there. Though I see how they might reach that conclusion. I, I think it was adjustments. It was modifications being made as society learned to use this new technology. But uh, I, I wouldn't necessarily refer to it as the feminization. That's the subject for a different uh, course or over uh, a beverage of your choice at another time. Now, um, before the introduction of these calculating machines, offices were largely male bastion. But I think that's more of a, a cultural uh, requirement as opposed to a feminization. Uh, so you, you can see this male bastion even in uh, the opening, uh, some of the scenes of the movie The Greatest Showman. Fabulous movie. I really like it and I recommend it. But in The Greatest Showman, he worked in a counting house, uh, accounting for ship's cargo as it sailed around. And um, they were all men, right? I'm just trying to make it more real. If you've seen the movie, if not, I recommend it. It's, it's a very interesting uh, story, all right? Now, calculators then began to really de uh, level the playing field. This is a, a picture from the author, uh, what they would refer to as that feminization of bookkeeping. Again, I think that's a conversation for another time. Now, uh, accounting and embezzlement were also becoming issues. So you see that with technology, we have to apply our social norms or our philosophical approach. What's good for society? Uh, and how do we apply that in the law? So. Uh, people would steal cash by not creating receipts. To solve this, a restaurateur in Dayton, Ohio, uh, invented the cash register. He came up with the idea while he was traveling abroad, right? It basically an adding machine that expresses values in dollars and cents. And there's a picture of the uh, adding machine in a Dayton, Ohio store, a shoeshine parlor, I believe, uh, that was referenced in the Quinn text. Um, technology, though, didn't quit, right? That, and, oh, even with the cash register, it would ring a bell, right? So people would know when the drawer was open, right, to help stop embezzlement. So it was great. Competition working for us. Now, I'm going to stop there because we make a major leap forward into punch cards and um, other tabulators next. Uh, so come back for the next uh, portion of this lecture. Thank you.